it's Dr. Ellen Wood. Um, I am one of the physicians at IVFMD. My office is in Cooper City, if anybody has seen me or is interested in seeing me. And tonight we are doing another Q&A with Dr. Farrar Duro, okay? And she's gonna be joining us. Um, I just saw her um, log on. Um, we're on the IVFMD platform tonight. And Dr. Duro is going to be um, joining us. Let's see here if I can invite her. There we go, requests and requests. Um, and we're gonna be answering fertility questions. So we had some submitted earlier, which is great. Um, if you don't know me, um, again, one of the 12 physicians at IBFMD, Cooper City office. Um, we have offices in Miami. We have offices in Naples. We have an office in um, Boca. We have an office in Jupiter. We have an office in Vieira. Um, and we have 12 of us, and so we're all here for you. Um, at any of our different locations, wherever you may be located. And Dr. Duro has just joined us. Welcome, welcome, welcome for another Wednesday night um, Q&A. Um, you know, feel free to introduce yourself and um, tell us about your practice. Hi, uh, my name is Farah Duro, and I'm a reproductive acupuncturist and functional medicine practitioner. I'm in uh, Hylia Gardens, so we're uh, in near Broward in Miami, kind of in the middle. <laughs> and we've been working with... Uh, Dr. Wood's patients and my VFMD's patients and uh, many patients throughout the last, um, let's say 10, no, about 15 years now, it's been a while. <laughs> so we're here to answer your questions tonight. We always have such good engaging questions uh, and it's always, we've been doing this for a while, but we always learn more. So uh, definitely don't be shy, don't be afraid to ask. We're here for you. Excellent. Well, Can you welcome everybody who's joining us. Um, so mm -hmm. we did have some questions that were submitted um, earlier. And so I'd like to get to those first before any new ones come in. Um, if I can't see anything, um, Dr. Duro, just, just let me know. Um, the one that I see first off that was submitted earlier um, that, that um, Shirley sent me was, um, what's the reason behind choosing frozen versus fresh transfers in IVF? Okay, so <laughs> this is kind of a loaded question, um, and it has, there's multiple different reasons why um, we would recommend one over the other. So the first reason to select a frozen transfer over a fresh is because a couple who is undergoing IVF um, wants their embryos tested for their health. So what that means is taking a biopsy off of the embryo, and we biopsy what is called the trophoblast, which is the placenta part of the embryo. However, in order to do that and get results on the health of the trophoblast, which should be a mirror image of the baby part of the embryo, which is called the inner cell mass, they should be the same. In order to get those results, it takes two to three weeks. So, we have a pretty embryo in front of us. It's gorgeous, it's picture perfect. However, pretty doesn't equal healthy. So in order to determine its health, the number of chromosomes that are inside the embryo, that's why we do a biopsy. So in order to get those results, we have to freeze and cryopreserve the embryo. And then once the embryo is cryopreserved, we wait for the results. Our survival rate on these frozen embryos is excellent, which is, you know, for us, it's awesome. I mean, it's very, very, very rare that an embryo would not survive this freeze if it's healthy. But we're able to identify now in the embryo whether it has a normal amount of chromosomes or extra ones. Extra chromosomes, unfortunately, might lead to miscarriage. So that is something that is nice to know before you put it back. Because you can have a cohort of six picture perfect, beautiful embryos, and only two actually have the right number of chromosomes. An embryo with extra chromosomes, such as um, Down syndrome, means that embryo has an extra chromosome 21, those embryos can look fantastic in the laboratory. And so in order to gather this extra information, we would freeze the embryo, test it, biopsy it, freeze it, wait for results. So this is why the majority of frozen embryo transfers are done. That's number one reason. The second reason that frozen embryo transfers are done are in case the patient 
overstimulates. So if a patient takes the medicine that we give them for in vitro, which are called gonadotropins, and these are injections that we take, we prescribe to, for you to take to give you more eggs. So a woman naturally ovulates one egg a month, okay? One egg doesn't really make IVF cost efficient. <laughs> so we like a few more than that. Um, I mean, it, it makes us feel good. Numbers in this business are, are everything. So um, if we give you hormone injections, then you're more likely to produce five, 10, 15, 20 eggs. The problem is when you produce more eggs, your hormone level of estrogen can rise very, very high. If that occurs, what we have noted, and this is only in the past couple of years, is that an I put an embryo back in fresh, if your estrogen level is too high, particularly over three steps, the embryos don't seem to stick as well. You know, this is on new news. I mean, I did this, I put embryos back in people with very high estrogen levels all the time, um, you know, for the first 17 years of my career. So this is not like this, IVF is we are constantly learning, constantly, mm -hmm. constantly, constantly learning. But we just learned several years ago that if we don't do this, the patient will have a better chance of getting pregnant if we froze the embryo, let her ovary shrink, let the estrogen level come down, and then replace the embryo. Whether it's tested or not, that doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be tested. And we put it back in a frozen transfer cycle. So that's the second reason. Um, why we freeze. So they're the two big ones. Then why would we do a fresh transfer? Well, we do a fresh transfer because we do have patients that come through that don't over respond that, and may not be good candidates to have their embryos biopsied because they're not making a lot of embryos. So you've come through, let's say you have diminished ovarian reserve. And in patients who have diminished ovarian reserve, it doesn't mean they can't get pregnant. It doesn't mean they don't have healthy eggs. But sometimes it just doesn't make logistical sense to do all this extra stuff when if you're just going to have, let's say, four or five eggs retrieved, two or three fertilized, and maybe at the end of the day, of those eggs we have retrieved, we've got one embryo. I mean, one embryo, and it's a beautiful embryo. It may just make more sense to put that pretty embryo in and pray instead of biopsying, freezing, because there's no selection involved. If you have six embryos, I, I, I know they're not all normal. I wish they were, but I know they're not. But if you just have one embryo, in some, in some cases, and the estrogen level is not too high, it does make more sense to replace that embryo in, in a fresh cycle. So we as doctors have to assess your age, your hormone levels, what our experience is based on those things, and see what would fit best for you. And it's not a one-size-fits-all you know, type, type of endeavor. Um, so... The majority of our transfers currently are done frozen, um, but mainly that is because most of the embryos are tested for health, as well as um, if you're if you're overstimulated to the medication. So that's a long answer to that question, but I think it was a comprehensive answer, and um, that that's that's what we're doing currently. This is not the way we practiced four or five years ago. Um, IVF is just constantly evolving and trying to improve, improve, improve success um, on our way. Dr. Durr, do you have anything to add to that? What's your take um, on this? Well, I have, I have two questions. Actually, what's your target estrogen level like for somebody, you know, who's starting and you're like, okay, it needs to be under what? Like what sort um, of We use about 3,000. So okay. again, I will enter train fresh transfer if the estrogen level is under 3,000. Um, and yeah. then over 3,000, um, I think that, that's, that they should freeze. Okay. And the other is about mosaic embryos. Like what about, you know, we had a patient with, you know, two, like, that were genetically abnormal, but then one mosaic. So that is not like, you know, well, one that this will be transferred or, or is it? So let's talk about mosaics. Okay, so currently um, our policy at IVFMD is that we are not transferring mosaic embryos. So let's explain to people who are on the call and people who are listening tonight, what, what is a mosaic? What the heck does that mean? Okay, so what that means is that every cell that's in that biopsy and in your placenta, okay, does not have to be exactly the same genetically. So if you take 10 cells off of a placenta, okay, and it has say 100 cells, we took 10 off. Of those 10, five are healthy and five are not. Like, this is weird. Well, then what's the baby? Mm -hmm. We don't know, what's the baby? Like, we've got five healthy cells 
and the placenta is supposed to be exactly what the baby is. So is the baby healthier? The baby's not. Well, we're not going to go pull cells off the baby, okay, because mm -hmm. that could hurt the baby. So what do we do? So do we assume that the five cells that we pulled off that were healthy are the baby? Or do we think that the abnormal cells could also be the baby? So this is why we're not transferring mosaic embryos, because we don't know. However, there are some clinics that are transferring them. And then again, the, the thought process is, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Then the baby's abnormal, you get pregnant, you have a miscarriage. So what has been kind of published, you know, in small numbers, that if you do transfer a mosaic embryo, okay, it seems that almost 30%, which is not as high as it would be if it was a healthy trophoblast and all 10 cells that we took off were healthy, but about 30% of those embryos are actually making healthy babies. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know long-term follow-up. I mean, there's a lot that you know, hasn't been studied, but in the clinics that do entertain transferring that mosaic, 30% um, of the time, those five good cells were in the baby. So mm -hmm. if it is, say a patient comes back and they have four embryos biopsy, three are the clinic absolutely abnormal, like they're not good, mm -hmm. and one is a mosaic, and that's all they have, and you don't think they're gonna be able to do better, you know, these are always considerations. And I think as time goes on, like with any procedure that we do in the IVF world, as we gather more information and more evidence to say, well, the outcomes are, seem to be okay. They're not as good as they were. And this is the only thing the patient has, you know, more and more clinics are gonna be considering transferring these embryos where the placenta says they're abnormal and the baby is not normal. So I had the um, uh, personal experience with this. This was, and this was 20, three years ago, where there's a way to assess your pregnancy, okay, when you're pregnant to see if it's healthy. So this is pre what we're doing now. And that test was called a CVS or a chorionic villus sampling. And so what the high risk doctor, the maternal fetal medicine doctor would do is he would put a small needle into your placenta when you're between 11 and 13 weeks and he'd take off placental cells. And so we had a patient who's IVF and she was over 35 and she had this done and the placental cells come back majorly screwed up, okay? The placenta cells have all sorts of wacky chromosomes in them. But on ultrasound, the baby was perfect. Heart's perfect, kidney's mm -hmm. perfect, lungs perfect, body perfect, neural tube perfect, everything perfect. So the perinatologist said, well, your placenta may be trash, but your baby's okay because your embryo was smart and it kicked the trash into the placenta. So. Okay. The patient Correct. subsequently underwent a amnio, which is taking amnio, amniotic fluid from the, around the baby and taking that out. Amniotic fluid was perfect. So in many times, a smart embryo is gonna say, oh, we've got some crap in here, but the placenta can still function even though it has crappy cells in it. The baby cannot. Um, and a placenta will get, the, the embryo will kick the crap out into the placenta It'll give the good stuff to the baby, and that's where we come up with is these mosaics that um, are, are in question so much today. Um, but again, this is, this is an evolution. All IVF is a huge learning curve. Um, again, the way we counsel, the way we practice now is like, you know, com you know completely differently than, than I, I, I counseled patients and, and practiced five years ago. So, mm -hmm. which makes this medicine um, interesting. Um, it also makes it very rewarding because as we learn things, we're able to improve the success for our patients. Yeah. Oh, for sure. That's why we do these lives too, because I'm, it's always evolving, I think, you know, and there's issues now that you do as many, much testing as you do now. It's good to know that that can also yeah, be it's, an it's, option. It's, yeah. it's again, we're, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant learning curve for, for, for everyone. And mm -hmm. again, we try to give the patients the most up-to-date information. Um, that we have, um, we try, we have everything in our lab is <laughs> state of the art. Um, and so we try to use the, 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 the you know, cutting edge technology, um, everything we have in the lab is, 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 is just, is the best of the best in order to try and give, assess of the embryos and give our patients their best chance at achieving a pregnancy and also achieving a healthy pregnancy.
I had the idea we should bring on an embryologist to, the, to our diet. I, I, they, 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 really they, they, were, they were too hard in the lab um, to, try to, to, try to try to explain this, but it, they, they are fascinating to talk to. I've listened mm -hmm. to... I've listened to, I listened to different podcasts from different embryologists um, kind of around the country. And, you know, the, the, their take in the lab is always fascinating. And it does, it does help us counsel as doctors when we listen to the embryologist. Um, so it says, already recommend any free. Um, again, I just talked about the fresh and the frozen. So here's one for acupuncture. Any doctor for acupuncture that takes Florida blue? Is that, that's a, do you see that question? I mean, Florida, Florida Blue Cross is like really notorious for not, uh, in Florida anyway, not really um, ex accepting us. So we're not, it's not like we don't accept them, but they, they typically don't, um, the one that we've seen, we, we haven't seen very many policies that, uh, on our acupuncture. So eventually it'll change. Medicare accepts acupuncture now. There's many oh, wow. insurances Great. that do. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I feel like they'll catch on, but it takes time. So you can always call your insurance company and just ask them if you have any providers or if you have an in-network or if you have a network in general. I don't think that they do, but you can always ask. If you have a federal Blue Cross, they do accept acupuncture. So um, that's another out-of-state, you know, plans. You just have to find out. <laughs> I just, I said, across, Blue Cross in South Carolina doesn't cover acupuncture at all. Yeah. This is so interesting. Like, I, I, I thought most insurance companies did cover it. I, I really did. Yeah. No, I mean, there's great ones out there that do, but it's just Blue Cross, is, we've had the shoes. And if you do have it, we're out of network. They don't really, to my knowledge, have a network. So we just give you a super bill and you could turn it into them and hopefully they get <laughs> some reimbursement. So that's it. All right, so we got another question. Do you believe at home ovulation kids get this? Is a funny, okay, yeah, right. Give you 100% reliable results? Absolutely not. <laughs> Like, that would be nice. I, I mean, let's go here. I mean, if they're better than they're they're better than guessing, and they're better than an app. Okay, so mm -hmm. you know, the patients go. So how do you time your ovulation? Oh, my app told me when I'm ovulating. And like your phone knows when you're ovulating. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Um. And now I can say from given a menstrual history, we can try, and again, an app can try and hone in on when you're ovulating. Okay. So yes, this is all just based on timing. So if you have a 28-day cycle, the assumption is you're ovulating between day 12, 13, and 14, and you tell the app how long your cycles are, and the app tells you when you think you're ovulating. Now, the LH kits work for, I would have to say, 75 to 80% of patients, okay? Not 100%. I saw a young lady today who, um, she has polycystic ovary syndrome, so she has, you know, tons and tons of eggs which causes her ovaries not to function properly, okay? And she brings me blood work, okay? And the blood work, on her blood work, she has an LH value, and LH stands for luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is the hormone that your brain sends out when your ovary is ready to ovulate. So this is what's detected in those urine kits, luteinizing hormone. However, there are women out there that run chronically elevated levels of luteinizing hormone. So her level was 19, okay? A level of 19 is going to always turn your LH positive. She's like, yeah, every time I use it, they get a positive. I'm like, your level's 19. Like your level should be really less than 10. But any elevation in your luteinizing hormone, and that's especially what we see in polycystic ovary patients we're going to get that false positive. So this is where we have this, this um, issue with the kits. Now, the majority of the population, if you have a nice 28-day cycle, there's no irregularity to it, yes, 75 to 80% of those patients are going to be able to use the LH kit and to time when they're ovulating. Now, the LH kit detects your surge. You do not ovulate for 24 to 36 hours once the surge has started. So when you detect your surge, it's nice to get some sperm in there, but the egg has not actually been released. Um, you can also correlate that LH surge with your cervical mucus, which should be nice, clear, nice and clear and stringy just before your surge, meaning that your estrogen level is rising nicely. If you correlate nice, clear cervical mucus, you see it, bingo, the next day I get a surge. Yes, you are probably ovulating. Um, but there definitely is a population of women out there um, that have ovulatory issues um, and 
and we treat a lot of them. It's a very, 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 very common problem. And the way we overcome this is with ultrasound. So if we do an ultrasound on you and day 12, 13, 14, 15 of your cycle, we can see, are you ovulating or not? Normally we will prescribe these women fertility medicine and the fertility medicine hopefully will get your ovary to behave um, so that we can um, see a follicle growing on ultrasound and then we can tell you when is your best time to have intercourse or to um, do what we call an intrauterine insemination and place the sperm directly into the um, uterus. Um, what's your what's your experience, Dr. Jura, with ovulation kits? Um, yeah, they, they, well, we have a lot of patients with PCOS as well, so we kind of like go, well, I mean, I, I think it's it's hard to even pay attention to cervical mucus sometimes because that's not completely accurate as well with PCOS too. So, um, I, I mean, I loved old-fashioned charting. I still think it's it's nice to see those temperatures even though people are oh that's so old it's school fresh you know, that's 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 right. i know <laughs> it's just for, for one or two months that's it and and you know it's nice when you have a little bit of a biphasic curve you're like oh nice and you can you know use your ovulation test strips and you see the dip at the same time as when it's positive but um for us in chinese medicine we actually look at those temperatures as more significant than just a temperature so, um, so that's why I like, I like using those. And nowadays there's apps, there's Bluetooth thermometers that go directly to the app. So, and then, you know, you can, you can scan your LH strip and it tells you exactly, you know, it's pretty cool uh, technology now. But, um, but I think, you know, just for a month or two, not to stress people out or anything like that, but I think it could be sometimes helpful. And, um, and we've had lots of people get pregnant that way too, just going, okay, obviously it's the, Temperature is not going to tell you when you ovulate, it tells you after the fact, but at least you know you have a pattern and it's nice and helpful to see. And also if you have PCOS and you see that your temperature is high for more than 16, 17 days, then right. you're like, okay, now, now I can take a pregnancy right. test instead of just, <laughs> instead of like years ago, we had a patient who was like, I thought that acupuncture was supposed to help regulate my cycles. And she had like two pages of uh, temperatures, you know, and, and she's like, it just keeps going up. And I'm like, bingo. But you know, it was great because uh, it like, sh you know, most people get very frustrated with taking pregnancy tests and they're negative month after month after month and having these very long cycles. So at least it can indicate, you know, whether you should be testing or not a lot of times too. And it's free. <laughs> yeah. It's, again, that's, that's, that's the thing. It's like, you don't have to come to the office. I mean, again, it's just, you know, the, the issue is, is I, I, I'm just like, I'm all about efficiency. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm a goal oriented person. I just want you, you to come in, Boom, let's do this treatment. Let's get pregnant. Let's send you on your merry way. Um, you know, and again, if you're young, you know, under the age of 30, and you, you know, you want to look at the charts and you want to check your cycles and you want to do everything, all wonderful. And lots and lots and lots of women get there. But as you age, I would never, I would not recommend somebody who is over the age of 35 do this for more than a couple of months before they would actually seek an evaluation um, if they're not pregnant. Because age is the biggest thing we battle. And it, it's so hard for patients to realize that egg quality declines so dramatically um, you know, with, with age. It, it even, it's hard for me to believe, but it's just, it's true. I see it day after day after day. Um, we've got a couple questions on here, so I'll let them go by. Thoughts on the ERA hit two failed transfers this year. Um, that's where I think the ERA has a purpose. Um, I don't think in a first cycle, it's really statistically going to change your chances at all. I only recommend for some of my patients an ERA if they only have one normal tested embryo. And I just don't have any regrets if it didn't take that we didn't, you know, check all bases. But when you do a randomized prospective check trial and you say this 100 women um, do an ERA, first time transferring in a frozen transfer, this 100 women did not do an ERA, we're not seeing any huge differences. But potentially after, you know, two failed cycles, maybe you do need a customized estrogen, progesterone type protocol in order to maximize receptivity. So I do think it has a role um, in what we do. And especially if, if you have done um, two cycles and you have not been successful, it's something you should definitely consider um, and speak with your doctor about. Um, now, there were one failed FET, one miscarriage, I guess, it but we are male factor only. Should we get natural killer success or just try again? Um, I am a fan of immunologic infertility evaluation. 
I think it is just so easy to treat. <laughs> um, and I have been shocked over the years when I have said, well, let's just do it because we want to cover all bases. And then, I mean, I think it was, I didn't think it was going to be positive. I mean, I re really, now somebody comes to me with also weird failures and, and multiple miscarriages and stuff. Yeah. Then I, that kind of, I'm suspicious, but I, I've, I've just tested patients like out of the blue say, Hey, well, it's, it's, it's covered under your insurance. Let's just check it before we do your transfer. And then you get the result and you're like, Oh my goodness. Like, and I can't say to that patient, if she didn't get it checked, she would not conceive. Mm -hmm. However, I can say to that patient that, hey, look, it looks like your immune system is really strong. And maybe if we give your immune system something else to do before we transfer your embryo, your chances of conceiving might be a bit higher. So that's where I become you know, a fan because it's, it's, a, it's, it's an easy test to do. It, it's easy to treat. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's something that if someone, especially if a failed frozen transfer and a miscarriage, it's something that you should investigate, um, you know, with your physician. Um, you know, I, my very, I've just seen so many cases, so many cases that I, I really couldn't believe. I mean, when I had a lady, she came to me. I mean, this was years ago. Lady has three kids, okay? Has a tubal ligation. Meets a new guy, okay? Now she needs IVF, okay, with the new guy, okay? And... She's already had three kids. We make her embryos. We put them in. She doesn't get pregnant. And you're like, huh? Like, this lady's been pregnant three times. Like, her uterus didn't remember. And then I say, well, maybe your body rejected it. I, I'm not sure. And then you check her. And sure enough, her immune system is a little bit unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so we do another cycle. We give her the treatment. We give her more embryos. And she has a baby. I have one patient of my own who I made her baby number one, fresh IVF, baby number two, frozen IVF. Easy peasy. Not, I mean, no, nothing special, no extra bells and whistles, nothing, you know, no even PGT. And then we go to make her baby number three with IVF and she has an early miscarriage. And I say, this is weird. I'm like, I don't think you're, we'd ever reject the embryo. Like, that's just not normal. Like I get to pregnant twice. I've already done this to you twice. Like, come on, like this should be a no brainer. And I said, well, let's just check you for it. And I'm like, uh, it's not that expensive. And I just check, we check her. I'm like, Oh my God, you have, like you, your, your test is elevated. Like this is not like, I would never in a million years. And so now I have to make another embryo, make her another embryo. We put it back in and she has her third kid. But I, I personally have been shocked at, at patients who have had these issues. So I am at this point in my career very liberal um, to offer the testing because I don't want to think there's a downside to it. Um, and now in the day of you know doing PGT testing and quantifying you know the health of the embryo with a biopsy, um, where the embryos used to be the variable. So the embryo used to be the variable. So doctor, what, why didn't I get pregnant? Well, your embryo probably wasn't healthy. Let's do another cycle. Um, and now we're like, oh, well, we buy have a seat. If your embryo was healthy, like, okay, what's the problem now? So there's definitely still more we have to learn um, about these embryos that are tested. Um, but there's definitely additional investigation that we do now that we would have never done before we did um, embryo biopsies so um, liberally. So yeah. I, I, am, I am kind of a fan in, in, in doing a lot of these, a lot of these tests, but I do talk to patients about what the data shows because again we still as doctors try to follow data we try to give you advice based on you know randomized prospective trials and what did they find in that and say this is clinically makes sense this clinically doesn't as opposed to just kind of like winging it um dr Dura, what's your take on these things um yeah i think it's i've seen so many patients throughout the years that you've worked with with uh, the intralipids and i you just see a difference like if they've you know come from another place that, that didn't really even test them but they kept putting in embryos that were genetically normal and not implanting um you know and then and then you know switch and then th those same perfect embryos are actually becoming implanted and leading to a good pregnancy when you just change that one variable 
you know, it's got a, it's clinically, it's got, it's showing that it's, that, that there is something to that. So um, that's really important. And then optimizing everything else like nutrition and hormones and insulin and glucose and thyroid function, all those things that can also lead to issues yeah, in this There's carriage, so, so many factors. I mean, it, I mean, hey, there's a question here. What would you recommend to boost patients' egg quality? I mean, optimize your health. Mm -hmm. Your health carries over into your eggs. I mean, just think about pregnancy. So there's so much data out about if that mom who is overweight, unhealthy, diabetic, hypertensive, has sex, get pregnant. I mean, basically, the data shows her children, and these are fertility patients. This mm -hmm. is not fertility patients, but those children that were born from that unhealthy mom and the OB just had to deal with it. You know, mm -hmm. we just had to do the best we could to keep the blood pressure under control, to keep the blood sugars under control. You know, when that baby is born and they follow that baby through life, okay, that baby is predisposed to a gazillion amount of health problems because the mom who carried him or her wasn't healthy when she got pregnant. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, she got pregnant. So she didn't come to the IVF clinic. She didn't do anything. She just went out and had some sex and got pregnant, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. But she wasn't healthy when she got pregnant. And then they go to the OB and the OB is like, we'll deal with it. And that's where the population is going. We have yeah. a huge population of unhealthy kids yeah. that if the mom had been healthy when she was during her pregnancy, these lifelong medical problems might not be present in their children. So myself as a fertility doctor who has this unique ability, I mean, it's like so cool that we see you before you're pregnant. So we can talk to you about this. So if we want to talk about egg quality, let's talk about patient health. Let's talk about, hey, let's get your BMI down, you know, to, to, to a, a better weight. Let's lose 5% of your body fat. Um, I just had a patient who, you know, we had an embryo not attached. And I said, look, I think, you know, we did everything. We touched for everything. And I think maybe this is associated with your body fat. And, you know, I said, look, before I transfer another healthy embryo, I want your body fat down at least 5%. Um, and, you know, she committed to that. She did that. And again, I don't know whether it was just the luck of the draw that we put the next embryo in and it attached. And, and so far she's pregnant and it's ongoing. But it plays, it makes a difference. So if you want to boost your egg quality, you start with your health. Now, we do see ridiculously healthy people with lousy egg quality. I'm not debating that. Um, so there are certain things that you might want to look at, you know, in your life. Um, there are things that you're putting into your body. So as a rule, I don't like patients to eat things that have in the ingredient section on the label things you can't pronounce mm -hmm. so any preservative you can't pronounce on say whether it's a protein bar or in a cookie or in some sort of processed food don't eat. okay if you are following a you know great fruit lots of fruits and vegetables diet type of thing there's certain fruits and vegetables that some things will actually it's like this is a spinach is healthy well, regular spinach apparently is not. It has like a thousand times the amount of pesticides are supposed to be in regular spinach. Like if you're going to eat leafy spinach in a spinach salad, it's okay. It needs to be organic. I mean, the, the, the study that um, was done in 2018 by JAMA, it was only 325 women, but it was in, um, done at um, uh, Boston IVF or Mass General. Mass General in, uh, I mean, it showed that women who ate regular fruits and vegetables that had pesticides on them, had a lower IVF success rate, even though they consumed more fruits and vegetables than the ones that ate a lower amount of fruits and vegetables that mm -hmm. were pesticide free. So there's things that you could be poisoning yourself with. So if you wanna boost egg quality, let's stop with the poisons. Let's stop with the processed foods. Let's stop with you know um, fruits and vegetables that have higher, that are known to have higher um, concentrations of pesticides. Strawberries, spinach, celery, tomatoes, apples, peaches, a couple others. There's like 12 of them. It's called the dirty dozen. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, these things are things that you should look at. Then there's like other things that you don't have to buy organic. Let's look at your produce. Let's look at your fish. Let's look at things that, you know, could contain hormones and antibiotics that could disrupt your, water. your 
Bottled water. <laughs> Bottled water. Let's look at plastics. plastics. My God, yes. plastics. Plastics are poison. Poison, poison, mm. poison. I mean, plastic water bottles, microwaving in plastic. Like, I microwave in all glass now just because I <laughs> tell people to do it. I think I should do it too. But <laughs> when, I microwave, when I microwave my eggs in, in plastic, okay, like, they come right off the side, like, and they slide off. I don't have yeah. to scrub anything off the side of the, of the Tupperware. And you're thinking, <laughs> like, that's a concern. And, I mean, I have to take a sponge and scrub the egg off the side of my glass bowl. <laughs> so there's something leaching <laughs> off that plastic when I microwave an egg in plastic that, like, that is keeping yeah. it from sticking to the sides. It's a little crazy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these are things that, again, they don't affect some people, but if you're in the fertility clinic, this could be affecting you. Um, but, you know, the plastic water bottles, if you're drinking out of them, if that water bottle heats up, the PBAs, even, you know, they can, they can leach into the water. You can drink it. It doesn't, you can't taste it, but they've shown that they can leak down into your eggs that can leak into, um, and they can see it in the culture dishes. I mean, the studies have been done in mice. They haven't been reproduced great in humans. Um, but definitely animal studies have absolutely shown that the estrogens that can leak from plastics can affect IVF outcome. Um, and that starts with the egg book thing. Um, they talk about the study that they first showed this in where, you know, they were, they were doing mouse IVF somewhere in California and their mouse IVF rates like tanked. And they're like, well, why was this? And it's because, you know, they were washing the where the mice got their water or the plastic container with hot water or something like that. And the mice were drinking this, you know, pl contaminated water. And this is when their IVF rates went down. And it's just like, that's just crazy. So mm -hmm. some of the stuff hasn't been produced well in humans because there are so many other variables, but it's definitely suggested that it can affect things. So, you know, patients who are undergoing fertility treatments really need to look at a lot of different aspects of their life. And sometimes they just, they don't realize what they're doing. They're thinking, hey, water's healthy. I'm not drinking alcohol, okay? Let me say, don't drink yeah. alcohol, like I'm drinking water. And then you're like, the water's poisoning me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so these are just these very, very, very subtle little things that, that we may not realize. And even as doctors, um, we don't realize them. However, you know, over the years, we've been searching and searching and searching just to see what, you know, what happened if something didn't go well? Like, what were they doing? What could we have changed? And I found all sorts of different crazy, crazy, crazy stuff over the years. And I'm thinking, I think, you know, her stop doing that made the difference. So, um, you know, there's definitely vitamins that have been shown in mouse studies to improve egg health. I mean, one of the big vitamins that we've been using for the last 10 or 12 years is CoQ10. Um, and that's something that improves mitochondrial health. It improves egg health. It improves sperm health. Um, and that can boost um, egg quality. I, I've seen it. I've seen patients who had young, great hormone levels. So I figured, you know, they're good. They don't, don't have tubes or they didn't, I mean, this is where their husband has a low sperm count. This is easy case. We do it and it doesn't do, they don't do well. We say, okay, let's add a little CoQ10. Let's, let's do you again. And it's like a night and day result. You're like, okay, that vitamin made that much of a difference. Um, but there are vitamins that come back to burns. Okay. Like two recent experiences. I had one a couple of years ago and one just recently. I had a patient who, um, prepping for frozen transfer, okay? And everything looked great. Lining, perfect. Embryo, perfect, okay? She was gonna carry for one of my patients, okay? Young, I mean, literally, I assessed this girl upside down and sideways. She was a perfect carrier. Had two kids of her own. All of a sudden, on her second ultrasound, in her frozen embryo transfer prep, her lining goes from like perfect to trash. It's 11 millimeters, it's beautiful. I mean, and then the clinic where she was getting monitored sends us the second picture. The lining had thinned to a seven and it looked like it was gonna fall out. It looked like trash. And I looked at this and I'm like, what happened in a week? Well, you know what happened? She started drinking a special tea. Okay. Red raspberry leaf? <laughs> no. no. Was it red raspberry? No. Oh, turmeric. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes. She started drinking a special tea. Okay. And I'm like, um, it was supposed, and she was, and literally, this wasn't, she, she thought it was healthy. 
Like mm. she wasn't, too, she was doing this to make, she said it, she said, I was just trying to get healthy, getting in preparation for the baby. Mm. Like that's what she said. Oh. And when we looked at the ingredients on the tea, it did contain uh, turmeric. So turmeric or curcumin, which is a spice that people cook with, which is also something that is amazing for, as an anti-inflammatory. So we're not yes. saying this is not a good supplement. Mm -hmm. The problem is it can block your estrogen receptor, okay? And it's used for endometriosis treatments, which we're yeah, blocking. It's fabulous for that. Good, right? I mean, yes. blocking estrogen receptors and endometriosis patients are good because they're in pain, yes. they're inflamed. You block the estrogen receptor, mm -hmm. they're out of pain, okay? Yeah. But if you're giving somebody estrogen pills and patches, mm -hmm. okay? And they're taking them and it's trying to thicken up their lining. And now they're taking turmeric and a tea or a supplement or a boost in your shake or your smoothie or whatever. Okay. It blocks my medicine. And that's what happened. <laughs> I swear, I, don't, I can't prove it. But it's mm -hmm. the only thing this lady did differently between an absolutely picture perfect lining and a lining that, that just, just in, 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 in a week disintegrated. And she, mm -hmm. she really opened up. Yep. I've been drinking this tea a couple times a day because I'm trying oh, to man. <laughs> So it's, it's, there, there's, we have this love hate relationship with you know certain supplements and then we think this is good and that's good the story's out i mean unless we do actual and i have to say mouse studies okay because most of the stuff we do in ivf we, we do mice okay because mice are really nice little controls and unless we just say hey let's do frozen embryo transfers on mice and give half of them tumor and half of them not i mean if anyone's in research or fellowship blah, 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 i can submit a you know grant get some money for this um and see what happens to the mice because people are so many other factors involved so you know the coq10 study was done on mice and that's why we all fell in love with it you know but a lot of you know animal research you know especially with in vitro um, you know, we need to, we need to check out these supplements on them and see what's yeah. the effect in IVF, because I think using a homogeneous group like that, um, in, in animals is going to be one of the only things that's going to really give us literature that we can extrapolate over into women. Um, because there's just so many different factors. So, you know, we get gun shy on, on a lot of these supplements. We'll be, they send us a list of all these things. I'm like, you well, let's go with this. I never heard. Not of everybody's uh, never going heard crazy that. now. They're they're asking all these questions now. Is this okay? Is that okay? I don't. Know. I know it's I, it is scary. Yeah, it's, I don't so know. Mm -hmm. I just had a guy. Um, also, he um, his sperm count. It was great. We were beginning the IVF process. We repeat our semen analysis every six months, and all of a sudden we repeated it because he was a little bit out of date. He was coming close to the date. I called up his wife and I go, what happened? I'm like, was there problems with this? Has he started something new, blah, blah, Had to get him on the phone. Apparently, the, because the, the fertility process is stressful, okay? I mean, it is. I mean, we openly admit this. I mean, we have therapists, we have, you know, psychologists that work with people. This is tough on a marriage. I mean, this is just tough on your psyche. This, this is a tough process to go through, um, you know, for any couple. Um, and so the guy, he was feeling pressure and he was having libido problems. Okay, so the primary care doctor says, try this supplement. It's called fenugreek or fenugreek or something like that. Mm -hmm. It increases libido. Okay, all right. I know nothing about it. I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, as long as you give me a sample, I can use it for IVF or insemination. Um, but the primary had recommended this, and I literally searched and searched and searched. Like, does this have? And this is the only thing the guy had changed that his sperm count went from like perfect to. Pfft. And I found finally, after a, you know 30 minutes of searching, I finally found animal data. Okay, because everything out there on the internet is like, oh, you boost your libido, boost your libido. This is great. This is great. And finally, I found animal data um, that says yes, it, it decreases fertility. So mm -hmm. um, I, I said I had we had him stop it. We had to wait a couple months. We repeated it, and it was, his sperm count went back up again. But um, so a lot of these things again without. Again, I think, you know, at least some animal data, yes, it, I'm sure it boosts libido and, and great, but it also can lower your sperm count where it raises your testosterone and can lower your sperm count. So there's so many of these supplements that I'm just like scared of and there's just so much internet data out there. And patients ask me, I said, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, so let's... Yeah. 
not and, and the same for medications, <laughs> over-the-counter medications, things like that. Claritin we talked about last week because we have guys who are taking Zyrtec for two years. Mm -hmm. We actually just saw that this time and the sperm count went up exponentially when they got off of the um, antihistamines and, and that you need to I mean, that one, I've seen that one published. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. What test do you recommend to detect patients PCOS? Okay. PCOS. Simple, simple, simple. Okay. There's three criteria for PCOS. Only three. Either have to have over 12 follicles in each of your ovaries. That's number one. Number two. You have to have irregular cycles or no cycles, number two. Number three, you have to have evidence of extra hair, elevated testosterone levels, chin hair, chest hair, balding, acne, things like that. You need to have two of the three to say you have PCOS. So if your ovaries don't have too many eggs on them, if you don't have irregular cycles, you don't have PCOS. If you have elevated testosterone and you have irregular cycles, you can have PCOS, even though your ultrasound doesn't show you have too many eggs. So you've got to have two of the three in order to say you have PCOS. So that's really the way we make the diagnosis to say, yes, this is, you know, potentially part of your issue. How long is prednisone recommended to be taken after FET? Uh, prednisone, um, I'm not a reproductive Im immunologist, okay? So I do prescribe prednisone sometimes in patients who have a positive ANA, which means they may have some sort of underlying immune thing going on. I try to wean it because I think there are some long-term potential side effects and complications with prednisone. They could lead to osteoporosis, okay? So yeah, you have a baby, but now your hip's falling apart. So I mean, these are things we have to, these are things we have to think about. I prescribe, me personally, a very wimpy, wimpy dose of prednisone. I have seen reproductive immunologists prescribe like six and ten times the dose of prednisone that I prescribe. Like, I mean, but people who go to these reproductive immunologists, these people have like, you know, a good, like, you know, eight, ten, twelve miscarriages. And, you know, the reproductive immunologist is trying to do whatever they can to help them have a baby. So the way I use it... Um, I usually will start to wean or stop it after heartbeat. Some patients with bad histories, um, I'll, I'll wean it at the 12th week. But again, I'm using a very, very, very low dose. Um, and again, there is absolutely no medical data to say that it helps at all, like at all. This is more just paranoia on the fact that, you know, you've done so much treatment, you've spent so much money, and I don't think the risk is that high. And I'm not really sure if there's a benefit but I'm still going to prescribe it because I, I just, I, it took us so long to get here. Let's have no regrets. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to, you know, weigh, weigh these things. What's the age of the oldest patient that you have heart disease? It depends. <laughs> That's a toughie. Because it's like, okay, are we talking with their own eggs or someone else's eggs? Um, so currently, you know, the American CLI Reproductive Medicine says that if a patient is properly screened and she's healthy, um, you know, she can um, carry a pregnancy and deliver up till age 55. So therefore, our cutoffs are at, in the 50s, um, 52, 53 to initiate the process. So hopefully they will deliver by their age 55. Now, this is not with their own eggs. This is with donor eggs. So we do not see very many pregnancies after the age of 42 using, with IVF, using a patient's own eggs. My, I have uh, one 44-year-old in 20 years who's had a baby, and I have maybe five or six 43-year-olds. Um, I've had 45 and 46-year-olds conceive on their own, no IVF. However, they have miscarried. We just had a 48-year-old conceive on her own. She unfortunately miscarried. So you can conceive on your own. The problem is the health of that egg is just, it's, it's not, you know, it, there's a remote chance it's going to be okay because you did conceive um but there's it's, it's a long shot that that baby is going to be genetically healthy um but you know people play the lottery i mean I, you know it's it's anything can happen and i never ever count out any age as precluding pregnancy i mean i will try with patients i will try with patients in their 40s mm -hmm. i will give them realistic expectations you know if you're 43 or 44 and you have great hormone levels i mean i've had a we had a 45 year old that the group approved to go through. She had an AMH that was like two. I retrieved 15 eggs from her. Like, 
I was like pulling for her. I'm like, come on, eggs, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> they all died in the lab. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an exercise in frustration because we just have so, so, so few pregnancies. I have no 45 year olds. Not like I haven't tried, but I have no 45 year olds. Even with like, like they are, these people are selected, like they are cherry picked to have like hormone levels that are that of a 30 year old, you know? And they're the patients mm -hmm. that will let try. Um, that it's just like, wow, I can't believe your hormone levels look that good. Um, and so we'll give them one shot. And, and I, I just, I have, I've tried and that's, I've just have not been successful. So the majority of our patients, you know, who are in the forties, again, we do recommend donor eggs. Um, they have a healthy child, you know, and, and, and life is good. They've got their family. Um, so we don't like to give people false hope. Um, but if patients, you know, look like there might be that minute chance, I mean, we'll give them one. Some patients will give them one chance. Um, but if the hormone levels look, look really poor, it, it's, it's just not a good use of your emotions, your psyche, your funds to pursue something that has such a low, low, low chance of success. Um, it, it's, 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 it's terrible when we have to, we have to tell patients this, but my goal is family. That's my goal. So if we have alternatives that can get you to that family, that's, that's where I, I like to go with it. But I, I don't have a problem evaluating and treating patients and, and looking at those hormone levels realistically. Dr. Jura, what is the oldest patient that acupuncture has gotten pregnant? <laughs> um, well, we have a 43 and 44 year olds deliver. Um, naturally, they had, they got pregnant. Um, I feel like those are the patients too that have had children also in the past. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but they've had already. No, I, no I'm telling you, there's a fertility gene. Okay. Some like, things happen like that. Yeah, there's so, a fertility okay. gene and, and either people have a fertility gene or, 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 or they don't. And, I mean, I helped, we had a lady who, she was 44. She came to me and I said, so what can I do for you? I'm having problems with pregnant. Okay. How many children do you have? Eight. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's your problem? Um, her problem was, okay, the mikvah. So she's Orthodox Jewish and okay. she, as you get older, sometimes your ovulation, you ovulate earlier. So she would go to the mikvah and was not allowed to have relations until seven days after the mikvah, but she was ovulating five days after. So from her religion, she was not able to have intercourse. So what we did for her at 44, it was almost 45, we gave her medicine to prevent her from ovulating, okay, um, mm -hmm. until day seven when she could have intercourse. She got pregnant with her ninth child she had an amnio. Her ninth child was genetically healthy. Like, I mean, yeah. fertility gene. And that was her problem, but that's how we helped her. Um, mm -hmm. And she got pregnant. So, yeah. but she really didn't need me. I mean, if she didn't have her um, religious restrictions, um, you know, she would have been able to conceive on her own. So we just helped her get around these religious restrictions. Um, but yeah, nine kids. I mean, fertility is, yeah. you know, you're pearly, you're fertile. That's, 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 and probably that's, her mom could have had, you know, kids during, you know, her later years as well. And all the, we had a, a 46 year old, she conceived naturally as uh, she had a teenager. It was a surprise, yeah. a total surprise. So it was like change of life babies, what they call it. So I thought I was a menopause. <laughs> so I guess it really, you know, it just does very, but, but yeah, with IVF, I have seen, you know, where, it's, it's crushing to actually go to some places that all will give the patients false hope and, you know, at 49, 50 years old, it can keep stimulating, keep stimulating. We're going to get these eggs. And it's like, what are they getting? Like, they're basically flying them to different locations, getting their money. And I it just, it's, to me, it's very frustrating. I know it's frustrating, but you, you, you see that as well. And, and, uh, you know, and it's devastating. So I, I just think there's much, a lot of research saying IVF just doesn't work very well past a certain age. And that's, that's, that's just, you uh, can get that's, pregnant on your own though. That's why yeah. I asked you, you can get pregnant on your own. And like, we don't, but the, 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 the eggs and the lab, they just don't, they go in different directions. Yeah. They, they yeah. you know, if, if your body wants to, you know, nurture that egg, yeah, it's possible. But when mm -hmm. you put it in my laboratory, even though our conditions are, you know, the best of the best, when you put it in that laboratory, unfortunately, those older eggs just in general don't do well. They, and I, I wish they did. I, I mean, and I can't say, you know, we won't have advances to better whatever to help to help these, these older eggs out. 
Um, but right now we were, we're at a loss right there in order how to help people. So what right. time do you, what oh, did you say? Oh, no, I, I was just thinking, I was saying my teacher had always said no gas, no go. So the mitochondria at that point, you know, just, they just don't have the fuel to keep going a lot of times inside the, the cells. So that's what it is. Um, menstrual period characteristics you could look for in a kid that really successfully. Yeah, that's it. Are you seeing that question too? Yeah, menstrual period you could have it successfully. All right, the only thing I can tell you is that your clear mucus changes to thick and sticky. So you only see the clear mucus for two to three days, and once it disappears, deal's done. Okay, um, sperm better be up there. So there's not really any menstrual stuff you can see. I mean, we like blood. We like progesterone levels. Progesterone levels will tell us whether we ovulated or not. Um, so it's, it's hard to say, like, if your period's thicker or longer with the ovulated. There's, there's really no correlation with that. Um, what time do you recommend take acupuncture sessions during the subcutaneous injections? Is there... Stimulation, maybe? Is there, is there timing? I think it's just more once or twice a week. It's twice a week typically recommend, and um, then we do treatment before the retrieval. If you're doing IVF, might, I'm not sure if they're doing IVF or IUI, but regardless, we try to time those treatments during that time, and then we you know, also, also treat twice a week throughout the transfer and after the transfer as well, and also during the transfer if you're able to, to do acupuncture at that time. All right, here's one. Stop treatment three months ago. First two months were normal. I'm now on cycle day 42 with no period negative pregnancy tests, what should I do? Um, so basically what we would do in our office is we would check an estrogen progesterone level. So we need to see if you're ovulated or your ovulation is delayed. Um, if your ovulation is delayed, meaning that your progesterone level is elevated and you haven't gotten a period, just wait, it'll come. If your progesterone level is low, your estrogen level is low, your ovaries are on strike and they just don't feel like working. So blood is like really something that's super important as opposed to say, hey, what's going on with your body? Like, why is your body just decided to, like, you know, not work all of a sudden? And a lot of people's bodies do that, especially after treatment. Um, but if you've ovulated and the progesterone says, hey, your progesterone's 10 and you still haven't gotten a period, check a pregnancy test. I mean, people get pregnant after failed treatments all the time. I mean, and they're like, no, I just did. I just have failed IVF. There's no way I can be pregnant. Like, <laughs> you're good. Um, I've had it happen all the time. Um, chamomile tea. I haven't had a problem with chamomile and I also have a problem with de decaf coffee. Um, I haven't had a problem with mango. So I think mango is, is okay. Mm -hmm. It's not plant-based, but you know about the dirty dozen turmeric. Yeah. Look at the dirty dozen. Okay. Because you know, when you read how they did the studies, the, the, um, it's, it's published by the, um, environmental working group. Um, and you look at the data that they used when they evaluated which fruits and vegetables had these pesticides on them. Um, I mean, they did a good job. I mean, I, 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 I really think they, they, did, they did a good job. And I think that if you ingest these things, you know, even though it's like, hey, this is a vegetable, this is, because as we tell you, eat colorful fruits and vegetables. Um, this is something that goes into your body, goes into your system. And it, it, it is probably what is, you know, driving the fertility business being so busy. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible to say. Um, ibuprofen, bad. Don't, yeah, don't do that. Um, do you recommend um, for some? Actually, there's a regular TSH, but it'd be low. But what do you recommend for some with Hashimoto's? Oh, I posted the wrong link there. I'm going to post the, the right one. It's ewg.org. Ewg, yeah, ewg.org. I sent a DM. How do I find a DM? Did you send? Did he send that to you? I send a DM, could you respond? Okay, I'll, I'll look at that. Um, let's see. I ovulate early, does that mean that the egg is not healthy? No, it doesn't. I actually have a picture in my wall, okay? Like, and this is a, such a cool case. Um, this is back in the Pembroke Pines office, okay? This baby was born, okay? And it's the coolest thing. The baby was born July 7th, 2007, okay? Patient mm -hmm. comes to us, okay? All she was missing was she was, she was, time, she was starting to have sex on day 10 of her cycle. We realized, okay, the patient was ovulating literally on day seven of her cycle, like on day mm -hmm. seven. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we actually realized that her follicle was a 20 millimeter on day seven. She was just, her body was revving up early. We actually triggered her, inseminated her on day eight and nine of her cycle and she got pregnant. I mean, crazy. And then the baby, I mean, I just think this is the funniest thing. It's because the baby's birthday was 7707. Um, I'm thinking she ovulated the seventh day of her cycle, so weird. 
Those That's weird strange. things happen to me all the time. Okay. That is a true story. This was just, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time, but that's all this lady needed is that, you know, she was just looking at her app and her app was telling her that, Hey, don't have sex until after day 10. And nope, egg was ready on day seven. So oh, wow. ovulating early does not mean that the egg is not healthy. It just means you have to have sex when you're ovulating. No. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting um, thing, but it's, it's very important. If you get OPK cycle 16, ovulate the egg healthy. Sure. My beautiful 22 year old daughter, okay, is the slowest growing egg you ever did see. Now, mm -hmm. granted, I was 30, 31 years old, but I mean, this follicle, I, I think it was day 21. Mm -hmm. I think it was day 21 that it, that it was like 19, 19 and a half millimeters. And the nurse was like, Dr. Wood, get in the room, give me the HCG. <laughs> um, I mean, but it was the slowest growing follicle. Now, she does look just like her father. So I'm not sure whether the egg was weak and the sperm were healthy. Um, you know, she, she does use his clone. So again, the, the egg didn't have that, you know, didn't have that stamina. However, the second daughter was a day 30 ovulation, okay? And she looks just like me. <laughs> so I don't count out those eggs that ovulate late, okay? Ovulation is ovulation, whether it's on day seven, mm -hmm. day 17, day 18, day 20, day 30, okay? Do not count out an early or late ovulation. Just make sure that you are active when the egg is ready because yeah. the health of the eggs, all bets are off, okay? Because I'm telling mm -hmm. you, I have two absolutely perfect, beautiful children, and the ovulations were like, wet. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we are at 831. Um, hopefully I got to, you know, we got to Dr. Duro, uh, you know, a lot of the questions are still a lot. They all come in at the end, um, not, not in the beginning. Um, hopefully we got to a lot of the questions. Um, we're back again next month um, answering your questions. And um, I'm glad so many people attended. Hopefully we got to some of them. Um, again, we'll be back again next month. Dr. Duro, uh, parting words. Everyone, you know, you can, I'm a Dr. Ellen Wood. I post all sorts of interesting information that I think is important as far as patient education, um, as well as um, trying, to, trying to help patients with, with kind of hope and success stories and, and crazy things that have happened. Um, because there's just, every case is different. Every case is different. And that's what I like to stress with patients. I like to try to individualize your treatment, okay? I mean, it, I'm, a computer can't do fertility medicine. We have to look at so many aspects of your life, what's going on, interaction between your husband interaction in your life, stress in your life. I mean, there's so much, so much a fertility specialist has to look at as opposed to just saying, here, take this drug and it's going to work. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive thing, which is where we like to incorporate acupuncture. I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of acupuncture. I think the stress that what I tell you have to do induces so much anxiety, cortisol in you that you need to go to someone to help relieve that. And that's not <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I, I love that approach, the integrative approach. So I hope that this has been helpful for you guys too. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you can reach Dr. Wood at IVFMD and you can reach me at Florida Complete Wellness, um, from FL Complete Wellness. Uh, thank you guys so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next time and have a good night. All right, everybody have a great night. Thanks for attending. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Bye. <laughs>